from Wisconsin's point of view, they see this game against Penn State as one of the biggest on their schedule. They see this as a winnable game, even though the matchup doesn't favor them. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Big Ten fans? He is Zach, Locked On Nittany Lions. I'm Ryan, Locked On Badgers, crossover show. Huge matchup this weekend, Madison, with Penn State coming into town for a night game. Zach, how you doing, man? You ready for this weekend? Are you coming? I will not be at the game, but I'm very excited because Wisconsin is, from my point of view, peaking at the right time. I thought that this Penn State game, this wouldn't be as tough of a matchup, but as Wisconsin starts to continue to figure things out, losing both its starting quarterback and running back for the season, uh, it, it seems like the Badgers are trending in the right direction. And this is a prime time game at night, as you've already mentioned. Yeah, I know Badger fans are absolutely stoked for it. This is an opportunity. I was talking about this um, yesterday's show. This is an opportunity for Luke Fickle to get his first signature win. And Penn State is definitely in that tier of program where they come to town and you beat a Penn State, especially this version of Penn State, who's undefeated, ranked through, uh, third mm -hmm. in the country. That's a national type win that registers on people's radars. That's what Badger fans are looking forward to. Can they beat a signature team? Can Luke Fickle get that first signature victory uh, as a Badgers head coach? Have been here about a year and a half now. And that's the discourse that I'm starting to see as well is that Luke Fickle, I mean, Luke Fickle's a really good coach, right? He led in Cincinnati of all schools to a college football playoff and then kind of parlays those results into landing a power four job. And this is year three. So this is kind of the turning point for him. Okay. Is he, if he's really that elite of a coach, those are the expectations is that Wisconsin, this is almost a must win for them because I look at it at, at it as, well, Penn State's, you know, hey, they're number three in the country. As great as this would be for our program, it is understandable if we drop that game. But the understanding that I'm getting is that, no, this is a must win for Luke Fickle because, okay, time's running out. It is year three. Where is that big win coming from? This is an opportunity. So I look at it as, I, really, I see it as, okay, this is excusable if Wisconsin doesn't win that game. But I guess maybe that's not the case here, Ryan. Yeah, and it's year two for Fickle. Just, um, but. Okay. But either way, either way, like you had, you can't lose every big game on the on the schedule, right? Last year they they lost at Ohio State at home at night. They weren't able to finish that one off. That wasn't the greatest Ohio State team with uh, that passing attack kind of floundering. This year you've already lost to Bama. You've lost to USC. You have Oregon and Penn State still on the schedule. If you don't win those, suddenly you're zero and five, in in the upper tier games. Like you're zero and five in the games that are signature events. You can't never win a big game. Right, especially when a bunch of those games are at home, when a couple of those games are at home at night. Um, from my perspective, we're talking, we're, we kind of start this show talking big picture stuff. I think James Franklin, from an outside perspective, is really interesting. Right, I, I think one of the <laughs> longest tenured Big Ten coaches at this point. Eleven uh, years, Sam. Huge. The win loss record is incredible, and yet it mm -hmm. feels like there's a pall like over the tenure. Like you kind of have to get to the playoffs this year, right? With the expanded playoffs. In the past, it's been easily excusable with the way Michigan has played and Ohio right. State has played. You got to get to the playoffs this year, right? Oh, yeah, that, that would be bad if they ended up going on this massive losing streak where they drop. OK, Ohio State is understandable because that's supposed to I mean, that would be that's my national championship team. Uh, and I say that, you know, I say, I say that as the Locked On Nittany Lions host. I'm not afraid to admit that. Uh, but if you string together a group of losses where. I mean, this would be catastrophic to lose hypothetically to Wisconsin at Ohio State in there. And then maybe the mystery team, probably Minnesota seems to be that next toughest remaining opponent. I, I don't think they lose to Maryland at home. I don't think they lose to Purdue. So those are kind of the three that would definitely knock them out of the playoffs. You don't get into the playoff at nine and three overall. Penn State controls its own destiny. So if they were just absolutely going to combust here in the second half and, and drop games that they're favored in. Uh, aside mm -hmm. from Ohio State, they're going to be a four-point underdog, it seems. But they're a touchdown favorite against Wisconsin. They're probably going to be a 10 to 2 touchdown favorite against Minnesota. All things, if they stay consistent, right? Uh, you know, teams can change over the course of the season. Don't want to try to, you know, jinx anything there. But that's that's the thing. Penn State's going to be, be favored in 11 of these 12 games. So, yes, Penn State needs to win. Like, I don't... I'm expecting Penn State to win this game against Wisconsin. I think they have a favorable matchup here against the Badgers. I'm not trying to discredit Wisconsin, but 
I see Penn State as the better team here. So the expectation is to win and then focus the attention on Ohio State because that's the turning point of the season, whether you're going to be elite or be that same team that's a fringe college football playoff contender. Let me ask you this, because uh, you brought up the line. It's about six and a half, seven, depending on where you look, uh, in favor of Penn State. I saw some some discussion from Penn State fans thinking that would be a little higher. Well, like, What's the yeah. overall thought process from the Penn State fans on this trip? How do they look at Wisconsin? And do you think it should be higher? Do you th- Were you a little surprised that this line came down to where it is right now? Uh, absolutely, because I think I caught it initially when FanDuel had released it. You know, FanDuel's the sponsor across our network here. And they released it, and that was part of my promo read. I said, oh, hey, look, the, the Penn State-Wisconsin spread is out, and Penn State is an 11.5-point favorite. That made sense to me. But then it got taken, it got pulled off the board. And then it went to eight and a half. And then now it's, at the, as it, as we sit here in the middle of the week, it's six and a half. Who knows if it changes by the time we get to Friday and then actually game day on Saturday. So yes, I am a little surprised. I thought 10 and a half points was, was warranted. We'll give our final score predictions here and, you know, kind of back that up in the final segment there. But uh, to see a five point swing like this, I, it, it's kind of back and forth because Wisconsin has the you know has the blowout loss to an Alabama team has the had more or less of a blowout loss right they were winning 21 to 10 and then USC came around in the second half and finally mm-hmm. figured things out and then the most recent streak of games for Wisconsin is Northwestern a banged up Rutgers team and oh, I'm blanking here Purdue. on yes Purdue and then okay Purdue <laughs> as the as the bottom feeder of the Big Ten this year and might be one of the worst teams in FBS football okay so we agreed that Wisconsin is starting to figure things out. I think they're peaking at the right time, but then you look at the actual results and it's like, okay, they're they're beating up on teams that they should be winning against and they're losing to the teams that they should be losing against. So all things are kind of consistent here, but other people see this as this is upset territory. This is a primetime night game. It's a revenge game for Wisconsin because of what happened in 2021. Two different regimes here, right? That's Paul Chris versus a Luke Fickle. Luke Fickle has no stake in that, but there might be some holdover Wisconsin players that maybe see it a little bit differently. I don't know. That's It's different in, in college football because of how much turnover there is, but there are Penn State fans that see this game as as a trap game. Yeah, I, I think the revenge factor is probably not there. Wisconsin fans are still salty mm-hmm. over the Big Ten title game with Trace McSorley and, and, and that group. I think that, that carries back. more weight. Ex- like, exactly. <laughs> Wisconsin fans are salty about that. There's not really a guy in the roster, obviously, that was here for mm-hmm. that. But we're still salty. Y'all y'all stole that game somehow. Um, <laughs> not that I'm still bitter. I'm good. I'm good. Air it out. Let it out. Air it out. <laughs> I'm good. I, it, you know, the part of the narrative that I think is easy to do – and if I was a Penn State fan or if I was a national analyst, I would probably fall into this trap as well, is kind of what you just said. Wisconsin beat the teams they're supposed to, beat them pretty bad, but what is a Rutgers? What is a Purdue? What is a Northwestern? Mm-hmm. I think what gets lost in that narrative, and this is what gives me confidence going into this game, and I think this factors into that line being lower, is they beat those schools by bigger margins than everyone else is to some degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at Oregon. Oregon just played Purdue, beat them by 35. Wisconsin beat Purdue by 45. And it's not all transitive. North, uh, Nebraska beat Purdue by seven, or Ruck, Rutgers by seven, and then Wisconsin took them to the woodshed on the road. Mm-hmm. Rutgers was favored in that game. Wisconsin beat them by 30-something, just trounced them. You know, you start to look at games where Northwestern beat Maryland pretty easily, and then the next week, Wisconsin just dismantled Northwestern. All three of those schools held far below their scoring average. All three of those schools, a Purdue team that scored 49 against Illinois, they, they scored six against Wisconsin, basically off two turnovers. So. Yeah. Yes, Wisconsin is absolutely taking care of business against teams they should, but they're doing it in a matter, a manner that kind of says that they're really starting to click. Because you and I both know you can beat teams in the Big Ten in ugly ways, or you can just dismantle them. If you put three straight weeks on tape where you just dismantle a Big Ten team, I think there's some substance there that is is beyond just who they're playing. I think that's a fair point. I I also do think it's matchup dependent, right? Rutgers doesn't have this juggernaut of an offense. Neither does Northwestern. Like these mm-hmm. teams that that Wisconsin's beating does not play co- none of them play complementary football. Whereas now you're facing a Penn State team that does play complementary football. They can turn up the tempo, go quick on offense and score as quickly as 20 seconds. I, I think it was uh, 13. I think they scored in 13 seconds against West Virginia, somewhere in that time frame, 15 to 20 seconds there. And then they can sustain the 10, 12, 15 play drive that just wears out a defense and keeps the offense on the sideline and keeps them ice cold. 
Northwestern, Rutgers, and, and definitely not Purdue. They they can't do that. They can't play complementary football. No, that's very true. All, all, all of those teams are lacking somewhere. And that is where you know Penn State is coming in. And that's not just a, a level up in competition. That's a tier up. And I, I've told Badger fans all week, like, I think Wisconsin is going to play well here. Again, we're going to get into score predictions. They have to play really well, though. Like, this is not a game where you can start slowly. You can turn the ball over. Wisconsin has struggled with that at times with Braden Locke. Penn State's really good. The defense is there. The front seven's there. Statistically, they're holding people um, on the rushing attack, and then they're not letting them convert their downs. It's all clicking. So I agree with you there. It is a much more complimentary team. I'm really curious with their offense specifically, with the Penn State offense specifically, new offensive coordinator, obviously. Mm -hmm. Where are they trying to... What is the identity, I guess? Because there's two running backs I love. Obviously, everybody knows about the tight end. He's absolutely incredible. Coming off one of the greatest tight end performances in history of football at any level. What What is the identity? How are they going to try to attack a Badgers team that's better in the back seven? Still to come on this crossover episode, Ryan and I will tell you which key matchups to look out for in this Penn State and Wisconsin game that's coming up next here after the break. And today's crossover episode is brought to you by Roy. Hey, Penn State fans, it's time to recognize the Roy Player of the Week. So far this season, we pooled over $20,000 to support players on Roy. Micro deposits that lead to massive change. With the Roy app, you can direct your support to the favorite athletes that you love, ensuring that all the funds go to a specific player that you choose. Unlike collectives, you know exactly where the support is going, and you even receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season from that player. The best part, it is risk-free. Yes, it's risk-free if the athlete transfers or doesn't deliver on the content promise, you get your money back. This week, I'm supporting Ryan Barker. Penn State was on a bye week, but if we go back to that USC game, he hit the game-winning field goal in overtime. Ryan Barker is the Roy Player of the Week, and I just pitched in $100. You can do the same, pitching in money to your favorite players, even as low as $10. Plus, don't miss out on Roy's exciting giveaway. They're going to give away two tickets to a game in November. All you got to do is download the Roy app, create an account, and use referral code Locked On, and you're entered. If you're already on Roy, any contribution to an athlete's campaign gets you entered in automatically. No purchase necessary and void where prohibited you can download roy now and join the nil game no subscriptions no fees and be sure to check out their social media and for more info that's roy support the players change the game i and it's an identity that can be whatever it needs it to be I, like I said, Penn State can go air raid offense if they need to. That's a former five-star quarterback in Drew Aller. They have receivers that can do different things. They don't have the all-around receiver that everybody wants, everybody everybody craves in an offense. But they have somebody that can be a possession receiver. They have somebody that can be a slot receiver that, hey, we know he's going to be open within five yards before the defender collapses. We have somebody that can go over the top. We have a tight end that can do it all. Take a snap. Snap the, you know, literally snap the football or take the snap under center, go deep down the field, be a matchup nightmare for linebackers and safety. So it's whatever Andy Kotelnicki wants it to be. Andy Kotelnicki says we'll run the ball 60, 70 times if we need to. We'll air it out 60, 70 times if we need to. So it's the, it's the fact that there's this element of surprise, this dynamic that you can't predict what they're going to do. If you guess, if you guess red, they're going to go green. Yeah, that makes it difficult for sure. Let me ask you this with Warren, the, the incredible tight end, who, by the way, is, is just an absolute monster. Did you know, Did was there an idea that this was coming before the season? For Tyler Warren, I thought he was, so James Franklin had been saying it pre -se off season, preseason, and then in the middle of the season, just kind of every time Tyler Warren would like raise the bar, raise the bar, and he was consistent. He said, hey, most complete tight end in, in college football. Uh, and then and then it turned into the best tight end in college football. A season ago, when it was Theo Johnson for Penn State, uh, and they were both kind of splitting reps. They were co-starters at tight end. Josh Pate, uh, CBS Sports 24-7 Sports, mm -hmm. had called Tyler Warren the best, the best kept secret in college football. So there was always this understanding that if Tyler Warren gets the opportunity, he will seize the moment. So now that's here. You don't have to split reps with anybody else because Theo, it's not that, oh, Tyler Warren couldn't do it last season. It's the fact that Theo Johnson was there and you don't just bench another 
tight end that was drafted in the fourth round by the New York Giants to say Tyler Warren is, you know, Tyler Warren's going to be the, you know, the guy because he can do these special things. They could both do special things and it was more beneficial to have them on the field together. But when you have that, you dilute the results there. So now that Tyler Warren's the clear cut number one tight end, it, did we expect him to take over and have 17 catches, 220 yards, and a touchdown and, and, and be a maniac? Maybe not, but there was this understanding that he would be all-conference, be a contender for the John Mackey Award, and be drafted probably in the second round, and maybe the conversation's changing to the first round there. Yeah, I think that trajectory's going up. How how do you guard him? Like, what what have you seen? And the thing with great players is you never completely stop great players. And yeah. even when you do, it's because you're devo- devoting so many resources to it. It's opening other things up. But is he is he a better cover for a big safety that's athletic and fast? Or is he a better cover for a, a physical linebacker that can maybe be there with the line of scrimmage? Or do you just got to bracket him and, and then say some prayers? So Andy Kotelnicki is just, it. he's almost getting to a point where He's scheming Tyler Warren open at all times. So part of it is Tyler Warren's really talented. Part of it is you have an offensive coordinator that knows the defenses are going to try to bracket him. They're going to do so many things. And I've just said good luck. But Andy Kotelnicki is taking it a step further to say, okay, you want to bracket him. We won't even let you do that because that's what most teams will do. They'll concede that player and say, all right, you want to put two defenders on him? Fine, that opens up somebody else. But Andy Kotelnicki's like, no, you're going to have to triple cover him because we can out-scheme you to a point where the bracket doesn't work, then Warren's open, and then you leave somebody else in single coverage and you take two defenders out of the play and Warren's still open so it's kind of just it's kind of crazy what Andy Andy Kotelnicki can do with Tyler Warren at tight end so let me throw this back because I feel like we're having too much of a Penn State Q&A Wisconsin on the other side I know came in with the expectations or at least I look back at ESPN's analytics uh, the FPI that they had they had Wisconsin inside the top 10 defensively I think it's safe to say that Wisconsin defensively is a top half team closer to maybe the top 25 as opposed to the top 50 but this is a team that I feel like is not living up to expectations in my personal opinion is that the, did did you view this defense as a top 10 team going into the season top 10 defense going into the season no going into the year I didn't and I, and I still don't think it is because the team okay. doesn't have a really disruptive guy on the defensive line. You know, I think every great defense, when you boil down to it, has a couple. Just, they just You can scheme. You can have the, the best scheme in the world and incredible technique and a bunch of great kids in the back seven. You need a couple NFL defense alignment. You just need or at least one. And to be a top 10 defense, a real top 10 defense. I don't think Wisconsin has that. So I don't think they are a top 10 defense, a top 15 defense. I do think I do think they're a top 20 defense. Like the, the back, the secondary is really good. If you want to start with kind of the strengths of this this Badgers defense, the secondary is really, really good. Like, okay. really good. A couple NFL guys back there. Um, there's a young freshman who's playing already. Hopefully, he got banged up last week, and hopefully he's going to play Xavier Lucas, who's really started to earn a lion's share of those reps. But Rico Holman had seven picks last year at corner, veteran guy. Hunter Wolder and Preston Zachman are, are a really, really good veteran, talented safety duo. That's really the heartbeat of this team. And then the linebackers are more athletic, faster than they were last year. Defense line has gotten better as the year went on. Uh, it's become more stout. Listen, the Rutgers team certainly make the argument that that's a bit of a, a one-dimensional offense. It's not great, but they can run the ball. Uh, with that, you know, that team is physical, can run the ball, veteran offensive line. Wisconsin just completely shut them down there. So they've gotten more physical running uh, against the run. They're really mm-hmm. good in the red zone. They don't allow touchdowns. It is a bit of a bend, but don't break defense. When they get in there, they're tied for first in the Big Ten in touchdown percentage. They're giving up 47%. So they usually hold teams to a field goal when it gets to that point. Penn State's offensively actually really good there, which is going to be a key matchup in this game. But no, it's it's a really good defense. I think it's a front edge pass rusher or a dynamic defense tackle away from being an elite defense. I will say one of the things that they've gotten better at, but they're still not there, is being able to rush the passer. And it feels like that's something Penn State has done a good job of this year is protecting Aller. And I don't think Wisconsin's going to be able to get to them without blitzing. That's that's one of my big concerns in this game. How is Aller against the blitz? And how is he if he's just able to sit back in the pocket? Aller's, so I, either way, it's kind of a pick your poison type of thing because he handles the blitz well. He's not a statue. He's not afraid. And he's actually got great pocket mobility. He's not going to beat you with straight line speed, but he can pick up five to 10 yards if he needs to. So if you don't leave a QB spy out there, 
on a third and five, that that's another player that Wisconsin's defense is going to have to account for. Then the actual blitz itself. Sure, Aller has been taken down. He's been sacked behind the line of scrimmage a few times this season. I would say that Penn State's strength on the offensive line, or if I had to pick one or the other, you know, run blocking versus pass blocking, I would take pass blocking. I think pass blocking has been better. Penn State has bailed out the run blocking with two elite caliber running backs in Singleton and Allen, and they're also really good at picking up the blitz as well. They are phenomenal when it comes to staying in as extra pass protection. Singleton had the one highlight where he leveled a defensive end and then went out and caught the pass in the flat mm -hmm. and then trucked somebody for the first down on like a third and six, third and seven against Illinois. So that's what, like, he can do it all on one play, and so can Catron Allen. But as far as Drew Aller goes, if you give him time to go through his progression, sit through, because Drew is very good, his best attribute is making smart decisions. Rarely does he turn the ball over. I know people might say in the comments, oh, Zach, he had three interceptions against USC. One of them was a, a last-second Hail Mary at the end of the game. And that that's really the first time that he's thrown two interceptions that are consequential. He had two interceptions all of last season. He has three to this point at the halfway mark. So he's not turning the ball over aggressively. Anytime that Drew has like an errant pass or it's really bad, it's either a timing issue, it's not an inaccuracy issue, or it's him protecting the football, like saying, you know what? I see the defensive back. I'm throwing it here, but let me put it in a spot where only my receiver can get it. He's got to make a superstar play here, but an incompletion is better than an interception yeah it's gonna be one of the key matchups of this game it is that that coverage from wisconsin that they're gonna try to play a lot of against drew aller warren and those receivers it sounds very similar to illinois like that what, what you're telling me ryan is that wisconsin has similar traits to what illinois is doing well but go figure because brett bielam is the head coach over there right but a team that relies on its ground game has you know i would i would take luke altmeyer over Braden Locke at this point you know feel free to de defend mm -hmm. the case for wisconsin's quarterback um, but I would take Tawi Walker over any of the running backs that Illinois has. Bottom line is that Illinois and Wisconsin are running similar sets where it's spread, but they're committed to the run. And then they have a really good back end of the defense, but the front seven is questionable. So what that tells me is Wisconsin's going to prevent the big play. And this one, I won't say that it's going to be a low scoring rock fight, but maybe not necessarily as much of uh, the, the points are just going to keep, you know, touchdown for touchdown, you know, offensive attack trading back and forth between Penn State and Wisconsin. I feel like it's going to be, you know, this, this is a must win for, for both teams the way that I look at it. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I think it is going to be a little lower scoring. And I do think there's some similarities to Illinois. I think Wisconsin's defense, the linebackers specifically, are a little faster. And I think their secondary might be even a tick better. I would agree with you. I think Altmaier is a tick higher. Um, the Wisconsin offensive line is better than Illinois and the running attack in general with Tywee Walker and a few pieces behind him, I think is a tick better, which that's going to be a great battle. Maybe we switch it to that. Well, Wisconsin offensively, what they've done. So there's really been a midseason evolution or, or up, update, yeah. however you want to call peaking. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, peaking for sure. And they started the year with a rotation at running back that really wasn't working. So Ches Malusi, mm -hmm. Tywee Walker, and some younger guys, Kate Yacomelli, and it felt like they just couldn't really figure out who we want to be that bell cow. And it's hard. We had uh, Brian Calhoun on the show, who's a former Badgers running back, played for the Lions for a little bit. And he said, it's just hard if you can't get into a rhythm as a running back. Well, a couple weeks ago, they said, Tywee Walker, Oklahoma transfer, uh, transfer coming in. You're going to be the guy. And he has absolutely exploded in that role. He's been great the last couple weeks. Physical, always falls forward, runs between the tackles, makes a couple guys get him every time. Um, that switch has really triggered this offense. Whereas now he's that bell cow. You have a couple younger guys coming in behind him. Braden Locke has been up or down, but he's really been able to, when that running game is established, he's really been able to play off that. And he actually is a guy who'll take some shots. Unlike kind of last year, Tanner Mordecai, or early this year, Tyler Van Dyke, Braden Locke is coming in and he's he's giving guys shots. He's trying to air it out. He doesn't have the greatest arm or the greatest physical skill set. And some of those airing out moments lead to picks. Like he's had too many yeah. turnovers. But he is a guy where if Penn State is forced to pay a little more attention to a running game, he will pop something behind him. I'm curious that to me, if Penn State can stop the run or if they can hold up, I know they're coming into the year, I think, giving up 3.2 per carry, which is one of the better numbers in the Big Ten. Yes. If they can hold up in the front seven, I think it's a long day for Wisconsin. Still on the way in this crossover episode, our final score predictions plus keys to victory for both Penn State and Wisconsin. That's coming up next after a word from our sponsors. 
And today's crossover episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out all the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more. And it's all on the same page where you place your bets. It's a convenient, simple setup. Plus, you're going to get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's all it takes. $5 to get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. You just got to place that first $5 bet. That's over at FanDuel.com. And if you look over at FanDuel, the lines are up for Penn State at Wisconsin. Penn State is a six and a half point favorite. That spread opened up as a double digit favorite for Penn State. Now it's down to six and a half. The money line for Penn State is minus 230. It's plus 188 for Wisconsin and the total is set at 47 and a half. If you like those lines, you can bet them right now at FanDuel.com. Again, that is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Yeah, and, and it's I, I think this is where the coaching kind of comes into play here. It, it's going to be a chess match because I feel like Luke Fickle can scheme some of those things. Penn State's run defense has been consistent. They've been really good. They're not to the extent like last year, the, uh, UCLA and Penn State were the top teams when it came to, when it came to yards per carry. And that's those are the metrics that I always look at. So I'm glad to see somebody else on the Locked On Podcast Network here appreciates yards per play, yards per pass, yards per carry, because you can't get a full understanding of yards per game. Because mm-hmm. a lot a lot happens there. So that's why, because how many plays are being run in that game? Did that go to overtime? Oh my goodness, they let up 500 yards, but how many plays were run? So you need to look at, so that's why it's important. So when Penn State faces a, a running team that's going to run the ball 50, 60 times, uh, and they hold them to three yards per carry, that's really, like, they held the Illinois offense in check. They were very committed to the run. They said, we are going to run it on first and second down. And Penn State said, we dare you. And that's why Illinois was only held to seven points. So Wisconsin is going to have to change things up. They can't say, okay, we'll go first down, make it second and seven. Second down, we're going to try to make it third and four. No, Penn State is going to say, okay, if you want to do that, we can force you into a third and eight, third and 10 type of situation. You're not just going to get an easy five yards on the ground each time. You have to do things to get creative, to get those yards. They they make you earn your yards. That's really what it is defensively. They make you earn your yards. You can't just bully Penn State like maybe in, in years past defensively because Brent Pride defenses were prone to a big explosive play at times. But then Manny Diaz, when he was settled in, and now Tom Allen. I, I mean, I think with two new systems like this, Ryan, for Andy Kotelnicki and, and Tom Allen, Penn State's defense and offense are seeing very good results for two new systems. I know the players are in place, but you still got to get adjusted to them. So the fact that I don't think Penn State has hit its peak as a team across the board, they're already putting up 30 plus points a game against mm-hmm. quality opponents. They're already holding teams to, you know, this amount of yards per carry or this amount of points, especially in the second half. They have been so good at shutting teams down in the second half. So Wisconsin might be in the thick of it come the first half, but the telling story is, okay, third and fourth quarter, Penn State really makes its adjustments. How does Wisconsin handle that, uh, that halftime break? Well, and there's tremendous coaching firepower on that staff. If you're able to bring in, like, Cole Nicky is, a, is an offensive star. You just go back and look at what he did in He'll Kansas. Be a head coach soon enough. Absolutely deserves it. And then Tom Allen is a bona fide defensive guy. Like, the, the coaching talent there is amazing. So it's not a surprise to me that halftime adjustments for Penn State, they, they typically get an edge there. I do, I am curious with Penn State and your thoughts on this. Have they really been physically challenged? Uh, for four quarters, and you could say maybe Illinois wants to be physical. Illinois' offensive line is not as good as Wisconsin's. I, okay. I mean, maybe this game will tell us differently. Having watched them, having watched Wisconsin, this is a really, really good physical Wisconsin offensive line with a battering ram and a couple running backs. I don't know if Penn State has been challenged for four quarters physically. USC is a really good team. Mm-hmm. They're not going to physically necessarily challenge you for four quarters. I would say if you're looking, if you're talking strictly on physicality, and that's what I'm understanding here, Ryan, Illinois would be the closest iteration of that. A ground and pound physical team that can turn any game into a rock fight. Uh, West Virginia was supposed to be that, but Penn State built such a lead that West Virginia had to throw away its game plan. So that would have been the ideal team to, hey, you know, we can trade, we can keep trading punches back and forth. Well, West Virginia had to abandon its game plan because Penn State 
executed mm-hmm. really well. They did really well, and they got West Virginia. That, that's how you win football games. You get the opponent out, out of their game plan. So that's what they did against West Virginia. So that should have been that game. But since it wasn't, Illinois kept it close for the most part, and then Penn State was able to wear them down and eventually pull away. So Illinois is the closest in this conversation. Those are the two teams that I would say. So Penn State has definitely been challenged, USC, in terms of those physical you know, push-arounds, West Virginia, Illinois, to an extent. But I guess maybe, you know, from what you're telling me, it sounds like Wisconsin's going to be the most physical out of anybody that I've named. Yeah, I think the game will, will tell that a little bit as well. Like, I think that the, the funny thing with college football is you, you only get so few data points against a varying amount of competition in different contexts. It's always hard to know for sure. I do think if this game, you mentioned the, the second half adjustments for Penn State, and I think that's a legitimate thing. I think that's real. I also think if you're a Wisconsin fan and you want to look at it through that lens, if this game gets into the third or fourth quarter, I think Wisconsin fans in that offensive line, you're going to feel confident if it's a game that you can start to wear on Penn State a little bit. Depending on the depth in the front seven, I'm not fully sure mm-hmm. what that depth looks like or even what that injury picture looks like necessarily. But that is where Wisconsin is going. At least Wisconsin is going to feel confident. Now, whether or not that's going to translate to the game, they do feel that they can wear out teams where they can grind them down a little bit. And they can go three or four deep at the running back spot. So. I'm curious if the game gets close, if that starts to play a factor, and then Penn State maybe does have to bring someone down into the box, and then Braden Lock can hit one of those shots. To me, that's a game script. If Wisconsin does win this game, and they are an underdog for a reason, Penn State is the more talented team. But if Wisconsin does win this game or make it a game, I think that's the game script. It's that running game, wear them down, and then hit a couple play action shots, RPO shots over the top. Well, that James Franklin's definitely aware of Vinny Anthony. I, I know that Will Pauling is the most targeted player, but Anthony is that guy that can, you know, stretch the defense, hurt you over the top. And I, and I think Penn State is just, they've seen it before. I don't, if they can force it, and that's the thing, the key for me is to forcing, I, Penn State's going to want to build a lead. Because I think Wisconsin wants to, you know, hey, we can wear you down and st- stay in this game, kind of turn it into more of a rock fight. They don't want to get into a shootout with Penn State. Braden Locke isn't built for that. Will Pauling, Vinny Anthony are quality receivers from what I've gathered. But those guys, that group can't take over games and get into it, you know, get into a shootout uh, a- against a Penn State team that I think can handle it. Penn State showed that it can handle a shootout against USC. Penn State showed that it can handle a rock fight against Illinois. So that's, I, I think if Penn State's able to build a 10 point, 14 point lead and then just eventually wear down Wisconsin the way that Wisconsin has worn down other teams, that game plan executed to perfection against Northwestern, Penn State's going to say, Wisconsin, here's a taste of your own medicine and kind of do the same thing. Yeah, and I, I agree with you there. If Penn State's able to get ahead and force Wisconsin into some concepts outside of its comfort zone, that's a problem for Wisconsin. Wisconsin's mm-hmm. game script winning is narrower than Penn State's in terms of variability. Yeah. Penn State can win in different ways. I think Wisconsin can win in a more specific way, but I do think they can win in that way. I don't think that is an outlandish thing for them to accomplish. The, the thing with you know these night games, these these environments – there's an argument this is a bigger game for Wisconsin than it is Penn State, especially in the, the scope of a 12-team playoff. Penn State has Ohio State on the schedule, right? They have, they have yeah. potentially bigger fish. I hate to say it, I'm a Wisconsin guy, but <laughs> like Ohio State, for a Penn State fan, a player, is going to register at a different level than Wisconsin. This is a huge game for Wisconsin. Night game, home game, coming off momentum, which matters in college football. It matters for young players. It matters for adults. Having that momentum three straight. I think all those intangible things factor into Wisconsin. The bye week's interesting to me. Penn State coming off a bye week. Mm -hmm. That can sometimes lead to slow starts. It's also great to have your players healthy and rested in two weeks to prepare for opponents. But sometimes you see teams come off a bye and it takes them a half a quarter, like a quarter to get into it. Um, That's another factor that's going to be interesting to track as this game goes on. I think that, I mean, Penn State's prepared for it, right? They've done it all season being that second half of a team. I still think that I think the bye week's actually beneficial for them. I don't expect them to have slow starts as frequently down there. I mean, there's only six more games for Penn State, but I don't think that will be as much of an issue down the stretch because all the problems that Penn State has, it's not a talent problem. It's a timing. It's a communication. It's a simple, small X's and O's execution type of thing. The only way you're going to get better is when you actually play tangible games. You can only learn so much about yourselves in practice. You actually have to play an opponent that's trying to stop you, and that's where you make adjustments because everybody's pushing the boat forward, right? For Penn State, they're all trying to do the same thing to reach a common goal. While Wisconsin's trying to, the all these other teams are actually trying to limit Penn State as best as they can, and they don't care what the result is as long as it's in favor of itself, right? 
So in Penn State's case, I think the bye week's going to help them not only to, yes, get healthy, be rested, long trip out to Los Angeles, and then you got to go back on the road to a top. Like that's a, one of the best environments in college football is Camp Randall. Like I, I do not, I do not question that environment that Penn State's going into for a night game. And I think that helps Wisconsin's case. And maybe that's why the spread has moved the way it has. But I also think the bye week is helping Penn State in a way to work on the little things and fine tune some things that can take them from a great team to an elite playoff, like a deep run playoff team. Wisconsin's going to test them though. Wisconsin's a, a good team, but I like I like all of the. I don't think that there's really any significant mismatches here, Ryan, when it comes to Wisconsin versus Penn State. I think there are for Wisconsin, but not not in Penn State's case. Anything that Wisconsin throws at them, they can handle. Uh, I'm interested in if there is a key matchup that you're looking at. Because for me, one I, one that I had circled is that red zone, right? As, as Penn State, Wisconsin has let teams go on some drives this year. But again, in the red zone, they've really tightened up statistically. Number one, actually tied number one in the conference with Washington. Just holding teams out of the end zone, forcing field goal attempts. Penn State's been pretty good there. Again, 71% of their trips into the red zone ended a touchdown. It's going to be good against good in that situation. To me, that's a big matchup. If Wisconsin can limit Penn State in those moments... Um, holding some field goals, maybe even keep them out of the field goal range a couple times. I think Wisconsin potentially probably even probably wins this game if they can win that battle. Is there a battle you're looking at potentially good versus good, good versus bad, or a matchup? You said there were a couple that you think really favor Penn State uh, in this tilt. Well, now after you know you telling me that Wisconsin's secondary is better than what they've seen against an Illinois, I'm looking forward to seeing Penn State's passing attack versus Wisconsin's secondary. See how the receivers are doing because they can go to a Tyler Warren, a Julian Fleming, a Liam Clifford, and a Mari Evans. I'm sitting off rattling names for Wisconsin fans that are probably like, ah, we can we can handle them. But it's the fact that Drew Aller has a bunch of options to go to. It's not one or two select guys. Like and Liam Clifford's gone over 100 yards in a game. Amari Evans has done it twice. Trey Wallace has done it. Tyler Warren's gone over 200. So you have to account for those guys. And then both running backs out of the backfield that can be on the field at the same time or one at a time. So it's not like Drew Aller has, oh, if you take this guy away, if you take Tyler Warren away, where does he go? He has legitimately five other options that he can rely on. So I'm eager to see what Wisconsin's pass defense does against a pass offense for Penn State that I think is only going to get better. And then how does Wisconsin control the football? If they do get, if, if they can play this where they can ground and pound, try to wear Penn State's defense out, play ball control and keep it a one score game, or if Penn State's able to build that 10, 14 point lead, how does Wisconsin get back into it doing something they're not comfortable doing? Yeah, I think that's a really tricky one if Penn State gets up. I, I almost think that's one of the keys to the game. Wisconsin can't let Penn State get 14 up, 10 up. They have to keep them at arm's length. And that could be down seven, and that's fine. Yeah. You got to keep it within a distance there. Um, you want to do game predictions as we're kind of wrapping this show up? We're at about 33 minutes. Yeah, yeah, we can All do right. I think final. I think final score predictions are fitting here. If you want to go first, because you... From from what I'm hearing, you think that Wisconsin's going to pull off the upset, and I do agree that Ew. this is more consequential for Wisconsin because this, if Wisconsin believes that it's a dark horse playoff contender, you lose this third game, like Wisconsin's out. Penn State already ended USC season, so now Penn State can do the same thing if Wisconsin's not careful. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say too, I don't actually think I think there's probably that narrative out there because the, the okay. playoffs. Are, I don't think Wisconsin is a dark horse playoff contender. Yeah, okay. I think they still have Oregon coming up. I don't think they're going to beat Oregon. That's going to give them three losses and two of them not exactly okay. pretty. So I do think, though, Wisconsin is trending in the right direction, right? I think momentum is building. And college football is odd. It just it, the better team on talent doesn't always win. And if you go to a team that's playing with a lot of momentum, has figured some things out offensively, the defense is peaking, and you have to go to their house after a bye week, I do think sometimes that translates to a lull. Um, I tend to think Wisconsin is going to be able to have some success on the ground against Penn State. Braden Locke has showed when that happens, he's able to exploit some one-on-one matchups. You mentioned Vinny Anthony. That's another guy that's come up recently. Like He's really exploded onto the scene. Uh, prior to last week's game, he was averaging 26.09 yards per catch. Again, small sample size, but he's given lightning to this team that hasn't had lightning on the edge in a long time. So now you have a burner to go with that power, that power running team. Um, it's a healthy team right now. It's a team that's found its stride. And I also just don't think Luke Fickle is going to lose every tough game he plays. And I think they're going to end up losing to Oregon this year, which means okay. I think he's got to trip up Penn State. So it's a combination of coaching, the team peaking, being healthy, and finding some identity on both sides of the ball. And I do think that line reflects some of that. I think that line is looking at this team and saying, you know what, nationally, if Wisconsin does trip up Penn State, and it is an upset. It would absolutely be an upset. Yeah. But I don't think nationally people are going to look at that and be completely shocked because I think this team is peaking. This Wisconsin team is peaking in the right moment. So give me Wisconsin, close game. 
Penn State's obviously very, very talented, but give me Wisconsin 27 to 24. Okay. I, I think that would go over the uh, total as well. That's over 47. So if the spread's going to sit around six or seven points, total's at 47, 48, give or take. I, I like Penn State 30 to 20 against Wisconsin. I think that road environment is a good one, but I still believe from what I see, you know, going to practice from what I hear that Penn State's better days are still ahead. So the USC win, the Wisconsin, the West Virginia game, all of those other games leading up to this, they're 6-0 and for a reason. They're number three in the country for a reason. It's not just a mirage. There are people that say that Penn State is extremely overrated. They're barely a top 10 team. And Penn State can't help who it plays. They have to win the games that are in front of them. This is another one. I think Wisconsin poses a, a very tough test. I, I like that they're going to Camp Randall, another another tough environment, but that bye week was so important for them. Hopefully now I, I hope the only reason Penn State loses this game is if they beat themselves. You know, look past Wisconsin to Ohio State, or you're stuck behind you in Los Angeles because that, you know, that was a lot of emotion. That that carried a lot mm -hmm. of energy. Does Wisconsin offer that same kind of juice? I would hope so, but I, I'm not in the mind. I, I don't I don't know the psychology of what Penn State is thinking as a team. I know the one and no mentality, but there's certainly this certainly can be a sandwich game because of what happened at USC and then what lies ahead in the team that has kept you down for the past decade. You also owe us one. We talked about it about the Big Ten championship game. You you might <laughs> it's not gonna be that easy. One. It's not gonna be that easy though. <laughs> no, I definitely don't think it's gonna be easy. I do think Wisconsin's gonna win and partially, listen, I'm gonna be there. So Okay. There's a part of me that's just hoping that happens, like because that place is going to be wild. But uh, for all the Penn State fans coming, I hope they have a great time. Uh, yep. Camp Randall is an electric place at night. Um, wish nothing but the best for the travels. Hope you have a sad travel back for all the people <laughs> embarking out. But I hope you have a good time up to that point. Well, I appreciate that, Ryan, and it was great to do a crossover episode to get you know, both perspectives together mm -hmm. for Penn State and Wisconsin. So, of course, thank you for your time. No, 100% Zach, same. Um, appreciate you. Too bad I can't see this weekend, but I'm sure we'll hook up in a future game. Absolutely.